So hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Sam Alkane. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Food Science. Uh, and today we are holding a special food safety office hours on highly pathogenic avian influenza. You know, virology was kind of the original impetus for these office hours. And early on in outbreaks, right, there's not there's a lot we don't know. How well does the virus spread? How long does it survive? How is it inactivated? But we're not completely in the dark. We've got data on closely related viruses that give us some initial guidance. And there's a lot of work being done behind the scenes in labs across the country to better understand this new HPI variant, how it differs, and what those implications are for public health. As these studies become more complete, our understanding and methods for the control of these viruses will evolve. And the point of these office hours is to kind of help cut through the online sound bites and help you engage with experts that learn uh, to learn what's going on and what we should be doing with the knowledge we have and what we're hoping to learn coming up. So we've got an excellent panel joining us today. We've got Dr. Diego Diel, who's an associate professor in the Department of Population Medicine and Di Diagnostic Sciences, and he's the director of the Virology Laboratory at the Animal Health Diagnostic Center here at Cornell. We've got Robert Lynch, the Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, uh, and is also a dairy herd health and management specialist as part of our pro dairy team here in the Department of Animal Science. We've got Dr. Tom Overton, who's a professor uh, in the Department of Animal Science and the head of pro dairy. We've got the Dr. Callie Neal, who is a professor in the Department of Animal and Food Sciences from the University of Delaware and brings great expertise in uh, food safety and food virology. We've got Dr. Nicole Martin, who is an assistant research professor and associate director of the Milk Quality Improvement Program here in the Department of Food Science at Cornell University, and Dr. Aliosa Trinchik, who is a senior extension associate here in our dairy extension group at Cornell. So I want to thank our panelists for coming. Uh, thank everyone else for joining us. I know a number of you have submitted questions. Uh, we're going to go through those in just a little bit. First, uh, Diego and then Robert is, are going to kind of give us a lay of the land of what is going on with HPAI uh, in the herds from a diagnostic sense, and then we'll move into the question and answer session. So with that, I'll pass it over to Diego, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Sam. And, uh... Uh, thanks for the for the invite to participate in this uh, in this webinar. We'll start by sharing my slides here. Just give me a second. Can you guys see the slides? Okay, looks perfect. looks great. All right, perfect. So I'll I'll just uh, be presenting a little bit about you know on on uh, iPath AI, the current outbreak that we have been dealing with, which actually started in 2022. And the work, some of the work that we have done here at HTC, you know, contributing to, to the detection of the virus uh, in, in dairy cows. So we'll walk through some of the history of, of some of the farms that from, from Texas that we've received and tested uh, here at HTC. So uh, influenza A viruses are viruses that uh, you know, ca cause uh, flu in, in humans and in, in many, uh, in disease and many uh, other animal species. Uh, they are uh, negative sense RNA viruses, so their genome is an RNA molecule of RNA uh, of negative sense. Uh, one particular uh, an um, interesting property of inf of their genome is that it's it's a segmented genome so the genome of in influenza consists on uh influenza A consists on eight uh, different segments these viruses they are classified based on the surface um, proteins the uh, HA uh gly glycoprotein in the surface here and in the neuraminidase uh, those are the proteins that actually lead to the uh, nomenclature that is given to, to this virus. So there is currently 18 known uh, subtypes of HA and 11 subtypes of uh, N1. So the combination of this uh, HA and uh, NA genes will actually give the name of the virus, uh, the HIPAT uh, AI strain that is currently circulating in poultry and that uh, spill over into the dairy cows is uh, of the subtype H5N1. Uh, uh, 
And the HA protein is one of the most uh, important proteins of, of the virus in terms of uh, immunity and is also is the protein that uh, interacts with the receptor in the cells, which are sialic acid molecules. Uh, and, and that interaction actually, uh, it's one of the main determinants of the host range or species susceptibility, and also the tropism of the virus, which the tissues the virus actually is able to, to infect. So the epidemiology of influenza is very complex. Uh, it, the virus, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is able to, is to infect multiple, or the viruses are able to infect multiple uh, different uh, species. Uh, aquatic birds, waterfall, are considered the natural uh, reservoirs for the avian uh, influenza viruses. These viruses actually circulate, tamed, in aquatic waterfall, in most cases, not causing any clinical signs, so they circulate uh, subclinically in, in those uh, birds. And eventually, there will be a spillover events of uh, those viruses into domestic poultry. When the virus actually infects domestic poultry, especially those uh, viruses of the highly pathogenic uh, avian influenza uh, phenotype, they uh, cause uh, usually severe disease in, in domestic poultry, leading to significant mortality uh, outbreaks. There's many other types of influenza that infects uh, mammals as well. Swine played a, a significant role in, in maintaining uh, influenza viruses that infect humans, and there's constant transmission of the virus between uh, swine, infected swine and humans, and from humans back to uh, the swine. Uh, the uh, the highly pathogenic uh, influenza viruses that are known uh, to date, they belong to two uh, subtypes, so H5 and H7, uh, and these viruses are viruses that will cause the severe disease outbreaks in, in uh, domestic poultry. The current strain that is circulating, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is of the uh, H5 uh, subtype. So just a brief history of this H5N1. Uh, influenza uh, or bird flu. The virus was initially uh, described or detected in 1996 uh, in Asia. Uh, and between 2003 and 2005, the virus actually spread to different uh, areas uh, of the world. Uh, the particular clade of the virus that uh, is circulating here in the US, the 2344B, uh, genetic clade uh, emerged in 2018. Between 2018 and 2020, the virus actually spread across the world. Uh, in at the end, in the end of 2021, the virus was detected. This two, uh, H5N1 2344B uh, virus was detected in wild birds in Canada, uh, and soon after uh, in the U.S. And uh, in February of 2022, the virus was detected for the first time in domestic uh, poultry uh, in the US. So here's a picture of the current situation of the H5N1 virus in wild birds. Uh, these, are, these are number of detections by state in the map. In the, in the left here, you can see that the virus has been detected in wild birds in uh, all the uh, the uh, mainland uh, states and also in in uh, Alaska, several detections in in those states since the first detection uh, in December of 2021. The map in the in the right on the right here is showing the detections in wild birds uh, in in uh, 2024. Uh, so not not very many detections, but you know Texas we have at least six detections. This is the Date for, uh, data from uh, up until uh, March 20, uh, 2024, and we also have eight detections in the state of uh, New York. Uh, when we look at the outbreak in poultry, uh, the virus, as I mentioned earlier, was first detected in domestic poultry in February 8 of 2022. Since then, uh, there have been uh, detections in 1,116 flocks uh, affected by this virus. 473 of those were commercial flocks and 643 backyard flocks uh, affected uh, with uh, H5N1. This actually led to uh, cooling of uh, over 82. million birds since the beginning of the outbreak uh, in the 2022. 48 states 
uh, have been affected or commercial poultry in 48 states have been affected uh, by uh, this virus. Throughout the uh, outbreak, one of the interesting uh, observations and, and characteristics of this virus is that several mammalian species have also been uh, affected uh, with this particular strain of H5N1. Uh, we were part of a, a, a group that uh, one of the first detections of the virus in, in mammalian uh, species when we had an outbreak of infection in uh, red foxes uh, here uh, in the state of, of New York. Between April and May of 2022, we've received animals uh, that were collected in the wild uh, that were presenting neurological signs, including blind, blindness, seizures, uh, tremors, lethargy, and uh, abnormal walking. Uh, we ended up testing 24 animals uh, that came in. Uh, 10 of those animals actually tested positive for uh, high path AI. These were all young animals with less than uh, one year of age. Uh, when we looked at the tissues that we collected from these animals, what we observed is uh, the virus had a, a, a marked tropism for the brain uh, of the affected animals. His PCR data showing higher viral loads in the brain of the affected animals when compared to other tissues, including uh, respiratory tissues uh, such as the lung. And then here you can see staining for the virus in the uh, brain section. Uh, the red staining here is you know, just staining for uh, viral uh, RNA, which is uh, was, was kind of interesting. After this detection, uh, uh, and you know, uh, there were several detections in, in other uh, uh, species of uh, wild mammals uh, up to date. There have been 215 detections in wild mammals. Uh, over 20 species of mammals have been uh, affected. And then this map is basically showing the distribution of those species where they have been detected and uh, which uh, you know, species are, have been uh, affected. Not only red foxes, but coyotes. Uh, there are ma marine mammals such as uh, uh, dolphins and, and harbor seals were also uh, affected with uh, with this particular uh, strain uh, of of the virus. In in those wild mammals, most of these cases are fatal. Uh, the animals are usually affected with neurological disease and will succumb to uh, viral uh, infection due to a viral uh, encephalitis. So in 2024, and very recently, uh, there were, you know, a few, the first report of uh, infection of, of with high uh, path AI H5N1 in livestock uh, is from a, a case in a goat, in a juvenile goat in, in Minnesota. Uh, and this report actually just preceded the report uh, of detection of uh, the virus in dairy cows in Texas for, uh, by about a week. So a week before the virus was detected in dairy cows, uh, it was reported to be detected in, in a single juvenile goat uh, in the state of Minnesota that also presented. So the goat presented uh, neurological signs, I think, and, and ended up dying from, from the infection. So uh, a week later, the USDA reported detection of the virus uh, in dairy cows uh, in Texas. And we were one of the labs that was involved in uh, uh, detection of this virus in, in those uh, affected cows in Texas. And now I'm going to just go over in the next few slides uh, with you know history of one of these farms that, that we tested uh, here uh, at HTC. So this is a, a dairy farm, uh, again, in, in located in the state of Texas with about 400 cows uh, in, in beginning of March or March 9. Uh, the owner actually observed a uh, reduction uh, in the dry matter uh, intake uh, by this by these animals. Uh, it went this dry matter intake drop was actually went unnoticed uh, by two or three days. Uh, it was only noted uh, on March uh, 11. And on that same day, the owner actually observed the presence of 17 sick, cows, uh, and those cows were presenting with uh, dry or tacky feces. They were all anorexic. Uh, most of these animals had no milk uh, being produced at the time that they were detected, and those that were producing milk, the milk actually had a thick uh, colostrum-like uh, appearance. 
uh, and uh, in this in this uh, table here, I'm showing the data collected on this farm uh, between uh, uh, beginning of March and March 13, when you can actually see uh, the decrease in the dry matter uh, intake that was observed uh, in the different pens in the farm. Some of the pens were more severely affected with almost 20% reduction between March 9 and March 13. And that became a little more accentuated, you know, later on from, you know, up to almost 30% drop in the, in the dry matter uh, intake. In general, an average of 6% uh, drop in the dry matter intake between in that first week and then that uh, increased to about 10% uh, in the second week. So on, on March 11, uh, on March 12, sorry, uh, an additional 26 cows uh, were noted presenting the similar, same uh, clinical signs. Uh, and, and here is a picture of the milk uh, that was sent to us by the producer, uh, the milk that was collected from those uh, affected cows. You can see that the color is not the typical uh, color of milk. And you can also uh, appreciate that uh, it, it looks uh, to be thickened uh, and looking you know, with, with the colostrum-like appearance that, that has been described. Uh, in, in several of the of the reports. Uh, on March 13, uh, this owner actually identified an, an additional 40 animals that were sick presenting the same uh, clinical signs. Then uh, the owner actually called a veterinarian who conducted a, a detailed physical examination of these cows. These uh, all 10 animals, of, of 10 of those 40 cows, all 10, 10 animals were depressed. They presented moderate, moderately uh, dehydration and, and anorexia. Most animals presented with a mild increase in the respiratory rate, temperatures uh, ranging between 104, 101 and 104. So not really uh, uh, a lot of fever going on. Some animals had uh, a little bit of an elevated temperature, but not, not really, nothing very striking. Two out of this 10 animals presented with diarrhea. Six of them had tacky and dry manure. Uh, and two of them had empty uh, rectums. All of the animals were uh, anorexic. So uh, following the examination, the veterinarian actually collected samples from 10 of these animals, and those samples including EDTA whole blood, serum, milk, and feces, fecal samples, and also nasal swabs, that I, which I forgot to list here. And uh, those samples were then sent to HDC, uh, for testing, we've received those samples on March uh, 15, uh, with the exception of the milk samples, which were delayed, and we we only received them uh, in the lab uh, a day a day later, and those samples, which was uh, on a Saturday. Uh, in that same day, uh, in the evening, the producer actually noted an additional 100 uh, sick animals uh, also present uh, in that farm. And here are just you know pictures of the milk samples that we've received from from this farm. You can clearly see that those that those milk samples they don't look uh, really like a uh, milk sample. So there's a, a lot of uh, changes, and some some uh, some of them are, are uh, with with a darkened uh, color uh, as well. So what what was the diagnostic approach in this case? So when we received those samples since the uh, we, we decided to take two, two approaches with them. We decided to use an unbiased uh, viral metagenomics uh, approach in order to, and, and this is based on next generation sequencing, uh, to, uh, to uh, you know, determine whether we would be able to identify any potential uh, infectious virus that, that could be present in, in those samples. So we initiated our testing initially with the Buffy codes that were separated from the whole blood samples and then with the nasal swabs. We subject, su processed those samples and subjected them to, uh, to uh, NGS. We, when we received the milk samples, those milk samples were actually pooled and we, we uh, isolated uh, milk, the, the somatic cells and, and, and uh, from, from, from the milk samples and actually subjected those to uh, virus isolation uh, in cell culture. Uh, as we were testing those samples uh, and processing them for NGS and virus isolation, we received a call from the 
veterinarian that he had observed dead birds, pigeons, and grackles in that farm, and also uh, several of the uh, barn cats uh, had also uh, died uh, suddenly. Uh, so we asked them to send us the samples. We received those samples, and, and the bird samples were actually tested immediately for high path AI. Uh, and uh, high path AI was detected in both grackles and the pigeon. Uh, we then decided to also test the cat for high path AI, and in, the, in, the, in March March twenty first, the cat also tested positive for uh, for high path AI. Uh, as we were completing the testing in the birds and in the cats, we were actually getting our data from the sequencing on the cow samples from the nasal swabs. So we detected uh, influenza sequences in, 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 in two of the cows, in two of the 10 cows that, that we tested. We run PCR on those samples and PCR test, testing actually confirmed H5N1 present in those samples. And uh, we also were able to isolate uh, virus from those milk samples that we had, uh, you know, inoculated in cell culture before knowing what we were uh, potentially dealing with. Um, and that was confirmed by, by PCR as well. In this slide, I'm presenting just a summary of the results. So from, from farm one, which is the farm that I just presented to you, we received those 10 samples, you know, paired samples of nasal swabs, buffy coat, serum, feces, and milk from the same animals. And this is the results of the, of the testing that we conducted. So we detected high path AI in two out of the 10 nasal swabs, uh, all the buffy coats and the serum were negative. We detected high path AI in one of the fecal samples and all the 10 milk samples were positive uh, for high path AI by, by PCR <clears throat> and uh, sequencing. Uh, in terms of viral load, uh, nasal swabs and feces have, had very low viral load, so high CT values in the PCR while the milk samples are very high uh, viral loads uh, in, in all of the, the animals affected. We also received 42 milk samples from a second farm from Texas, uh, and 40 of those 42 samples tested positive for high path AI with, again, high viral loads. And uh, we also received tissues from actually TVMDL, the Texas Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, from one cow that has, from one affected farm that had been necropsied <clears throat> at TVMDL. So we received lung lymph nodes and uh, four pieces of the mammary gland of this animal and tested those by PCR. Uh, we detected uh, high path AI in, in all samples in the lung, lymph node, uh, and mammary gland. Uh, but the viral load again was uh, significantly higher uh, in the mammary gland when compared to uh, these uh, other tissues. So it seems like in in this dairy cattle, uh, the virus has uh, sort of this uh, exquisite tropism for the mammary gland, and it seems to be uh, most likely replicating in this tissue being shed uh, in uh, in the milk, uh, as you know shown by all the, the PCR positivity and also by the presence of, of infectious uh, of infectious virus uh, in, in those samples. So a few important considerations, I think, although the virus is being shed in the milk of these animals, pasteurization should, in theory, inactivate uh, the virus that is present uh, in, in these uh, milk samples. <clears throat> so currently, uh, I think that USDA, CDC, and FDA all agree that the risk uh, to uh, humans is relatively low due to the pasteurization process that the milk uh, that the milk uh, undergoes before uh, reaching the the uh, consumers. Uh, but it, it is important to to uh, keep in mind that this virus is a zoonotic virus that you know prolonged contact with infected animals can lead to transmission. It's not a virus that is very efficient in in transmitting to humans. Uh, there has only been uh, two reports so far, I believe. One report in 2023 in a in a worker uh, from a poultry farm, and uh, this week this week actually a report from Texas in one. 
uh, dairy farm uh, worker. So not a significant number of, of, of human uh, infections confirmed uh, thus far. Uh, <clears throat> so if uh, sick cows are observed in dairy herds, I think it's very important that uh, producers report that to their veterinarian. Uh, if, you all, if you observe mortality in wild birds or, or, or pigeons uh, in, in the farm or other mammals, including cats, it's also important to report to the veterinarian so that appropriate testing can be conducted uh, and an examination of the livestock present uh, in, in the farm as well. If the virus is detected in any of these species that are present in the farm, I think it's really important to uh, establish enhanced biosecurity measures <clears throat> to minimize the risk of exposure and infection of the animals and also to minimize the risk to farmers, farm workers, uh, consumers, and, and other uh, animals uh, as well. So uh, we were discussing earlier, and I think this is some of the data that is available in terms of inactivation of iPad AI. Although we don't have uh, you know, data uh, showing inactivation in milk, there are several studies showing inactivation of iPad AI in uh, poultry tissues uh, you know, and, and temperatures of, you know, about 20 degrees are relatively efficient in inactivating uh, the virus in, you know, a few uh, days in some of these tissues. If, if those uh, contaminated products are, are maintained at, at refrigeration temperature of four degrees, the virus is able to, to persist for prolonged uh, periods of time. I think some of the uh, studies that are being conducted are, are most likely assessing the stability of the virus in, in milk and in other, uh, you know, uh, products uh, or potential sources of contamination from, from those affected uh, dairy farms. With that, I think I'm going to stop here and, and pass it on to uh, the next uh, speaker. Great. Thank you, Diego. Yes. And we'll get to questions in, in just a little bit, but we'll, we'll go to Robert first. Okay, do you see my full screen? It looks great. Awesome. Great, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Diel. Um, yeah, so uh, my name's uh, Dr. Rob Lynch. Again, I'm an um, extension veterinarian here with the ProDairy program, focusing on dairy herd health. I wanted to thank Institute for Food Safety to holding this special virtual office hours and including me uh, with the panel. I'm really interested in hearing what everybody has to say. Um, just uh, a couple things to mention. Uh, right off the top would be we're really learning a whole lot more about the situation every day and so just know that recommendations are subject to changes as we understand more um, i wanted to apologize ahead of time that these slides are rather wordy um, since i'm sharing information from other sources i really want to make sure that i i share those uh, uh the, that information correctly um, a majority of the presentation that, that i'll give is uh, dealing with farm biosecurity uh, related to high path AI, um, because that's where the majority of the questions um, that I'm getting are coming from. I wanted to uh, basically acknowledge where this information is coming from. And so uh, United States Department of Agriculture, their Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services and the National Veterinary Services Laboratories, the Food and Drug Administration, Centers for Disease and Control and Prevention. Um, my professional association, the American Association of Bovine Practitioners, has been very helpful. Uh, Cornell University's Animal Health Diagnostic Center and New York State Department of Ag and Markets. Um, and then just a thank you to all of these agencies and associations and uh, many of those uh, initially impacted farms and their veterinarians uh, for their continued uh, timely communication with what's going on there. Um, as they learn, as, as this problem emerges and develops, they share with us and we can, we can all be better prepared um, out here in the areas that have not been affected yet. Um, maybe first off, um, just uh, reiterate um, that you know, our food is safe. Uh, USDA uh, states there continues to be no concern about the safety of the commercial milk supply. Um, milk from these sick cattle, um, they have these clinical signs like those of affected uh, cattle with avian influenza virus um, is excluded from the saleable milk supply. And then we've got pasteurization, which is required for any milk entering the interstate uh, commerce for human consumption. Um, and that's been proven to inactivate microorganisms like influenza. 
Uh, raw milk, uh, just a, a, a caveat there, FDA re recommends the industry not manufacture or sell raw milk or raw unpasteurized milk cheese products made with milk from cows showing symptoms of illness, including those infected with avian influenza or exposed to those infected with avian influenza. Um, that's just because there's limited information available about how, that, how the transmission of um, high path AI um, happens in raw milk. And also uh, cooking of meat to proper internal temperatures is known to inactivate micro microorganisms like influenza. Uh, just to comment on the supply chain, so high path AI um, is a significant concern for individual dairy farms with cattle experiencing this illness. Uh, we know that as already shared by Dr. Diel, these cows uh, get very sick um, and they require a lot of support uh, to recover. Um, the herd level loss of milk production is significant. So it's a, it's a big deal for farms that have this disease uh, on their facility. Um, but that said, the milk loss resulting from symptomatic cattle to date is too limited to have a major impact on supply. And so we should not see an impact on, uh, or therefore we really shouldn't see an impact on um, uh, supply or uh, milk prices or other dairy products for that matter. Um, we typically have more supply here in the US this time of year um, uh, than other times of year anyway. So uh, Dr. Yale already um, described in detail what was seen on these farms when uh, initially infected with um, HPI, but I just maybe just go over maybe a summary of kind of the common findings amongst the multiple herds affected. Um, so they noticed a sudden increase um, in a, a decrease in um, feed intake and rumen activity in their adult dairy cows with a significant decrease in milk production. Some of that milk as shown previously took on the appearance of a, like a yellow colostrum like milk. Um, many of these cows um, showed abnormal manure, uh, typically either firm or tacky with some firms reporting um, more of a diarrhea presentation. Some other less consistent findings, but common nonetheless would be um, fevers. Fevers were variable, sometimes low grade, sometimes higher, sometimes not present. And then some secondary uh, infections associated probably with just immune suppression. So secondary infections like pneumonia or mastitis. Uh, infected cows recover. Uh, they usually get over this in about two to three weeks with virtually zero uh, death loss as a result of the infection. Farms that experience this infection in their herds, they um, report about 10% of the milking herd um, is affected. It typically peaks in occurrence around three to four days after it starts on a farm. And then it tends to uh, taper down until um, down to no more cases after about 10 to 14 days. This is seen largely in older cows and mid to late lactation cows. Um, there were um, uh, several feedlots in the area where this initially um, um, started down in the Texas Panhandle and they have not seen any uh, similar illness in those feedlot cattle. And again, so not that there were zero cases, but there were very few cases in the dry cows, the young stock and their first lactation animals. Um, so as already mentioned, so kind of here's the, currently where we have confirmed uh, positive dairy cows, um, which states they were located in. So we got Texas, Kansas, uh, Michigan, New Mexico, and Idaho. There's a uh, presumptive positive in the state of Ohio, and that's waiting for confirmation. And I uh, already mentioned previously, we have uh, no reported cases here in the state of New York yet. So uh, we don't know the exact mode of HPI transmission to cattle. Um, and so uh, that's going to influence our biosecurity um, recommendations. So exposure could happen through direct contact, oral consumption, inhalation, or via uh, traffic by fomites like contaminated clothing, boots, and other, other objects. Um, so infected cattle shed hypath AI uh, in their milk uh, based on those initial uh, sample results as already discussed. Other secretions like saliva, respiratory droplets, feces uh, are unknown, but plausible. Um, and these also may serve as a source of virus uh, for other cattle. Unpasteurized uh, milk seems to be the most likely secretion for disease transmission in cattle at this time. Uh, small uh, animals, as I already mentioned, like cats, raccoons, skunks, uh, they're susceptible to the wild bird strain of H5N1. Um, so these we refer to as dead end hosts. Their role in the transmission here is also unknown. 
So the initial testing of uh, those cattle samples did not find uh, that the virus has changed that would make it more, um, make that H5N1 more transmissible to humans. Uh, so that, that indicates that the current risk to uh, public health remains low. Uh, that said, um, there should be additional precautions taken for people with direct contact with infected animals, birds, cattle, small animals, or raw milk. Um, extra precautions are warranted to lower the risk of infections in those, those individuals. A little more on that coming up. Uh, so I again mentioned uh, previously that Texas farm worker uh, that um, CDC shared tested uh, positive for HPAI. Um, person um, had exposure to dairy cattle presumed to be infected with HPAI. And uh, so uh, CDC also reported that this uh, person had symptoms of eye redness consistent with conjunctivitis. Uh, that was their only symptom and they are isolating and recovering. Um, this infection doesn't change as far as, uh, this is CDC's comment that uh, does not change the uh, H5N1 human health risk assessment uh, for the US. Um, so it's CDC still considers that risk to be low. Just again, reminder people with close prolonged unprotected exposure to infected birds or other animals like livestock or to environments contaminated with infected birds or other animals are at greater risk of infection. So now I'm gonna um, spend probably the, the remainder of my time just digging into some biosecurity recommendations because that's where a lot of the questions are coming from. If we don't have it on the farm, how do we keep it on, from getting on the farm? And, and what should we do if we do uh, find it on our farm? Um, really wanted to, um, a special acknowledgement to the American Associated Bovine Practitioners their sub team of veterinarians, along with National Milk Producers Federation, have come up with a um, enhanced biosecurity recommendations document. And I'm, I'm pulling a lot of this information directly from there, as well as from, um, from uh, USDA and New York State Ag and Markets. So in general, if we were to kind of summarize where our uh, biosecurity efforts should um, be focused, we think about minimizing access of wild birds to cattle in their environment, uh, admittedly, challenging, but there are things we can do to help there. We'll manage movements of cattle um, and, and things that transport those cattle, uh, not feeding uh, unpasteurized uh, colostrum to milk, uh, colostrum or milk to calves or cattle or other animals, and putting precautions in place for the caretakers and their veterinary teams handling those sick cows, sick and dead birds or uh, small animals, and also those who handle unpasteurized milk. So dairies are encouraged to appoint a biosecurity manager, someone who's familiar with the operation, who can monitor uh, the situation as, as things change. This person would work closely with the herd veterinarian to set up an operation specific biosecurity plan to protect the cattle on that facility and ensure that those biosecurity steps are put into place. I think it's important to customize these things to specific facilities just because they all have unique um, factors around their facilities and management that uh, make uh, customized plans the, the, the best solution here. So um, in general categories, when we talk about animals, so from a risk standpoint, we want to delay or stop um, incoming or returning animals from herds with known or suspect health status in this. Um, and if um, animals do come in, um, it's important to do a, a, a quarantine, uh, we're recommending a 21 day quarantine period, just because we don't know the exact incubation period of H5N1 in cattle yet. Uh, New York State Ag and Markets is not currently uh, recommending to, to not, or they're currently recommending not to import cattle from affected facilities. Um, these recommendations could change as, as we learn more. Uh, equipment that, um, that transport uh, livestock, wanna limit the use of trailers to just your own cattle. Um, if that's not uh, practical, clean and disinfect those trailer interiors uh, that were used to haul cattle from other operations with unknown health status is recommended. For people, um, it's recommended to delay or stop non-essential visitors to on to on farm. Uh, New York State Ag and Markets is also recommending non-essential personnel traffic should be avoided on farms at this time. Uh, we want to limit cattle contact to those uh, essential for um, the health and continued operation of the dairy. Um, for those individuals, you wanna require and or provide clean clothing and footwear for those entering, encourage um, the use of proper hand washing stations and uh, provide gloves for those individuals. Require, you really wanna require disinfection of anything that um, handles, uh, comes in contact uh, with milk, 
and, and any other pieces of equipment that come in direct contact with, with livestock. Milk haulers should not contact farm personnel, animal housing, the animals themselves, or milk products that will be fed to calves. Um, this is just because of the, the initial diagnostics showing uh, such high viral load in those milk samples that we know that um, milk uh, plays a role in, in the possible transmission risk. When it comes to wildlife management, um, you wanna report findings of odd behaviors or increased numbers of dead wild birds, cats, skunks, or raccoons to your animal health officials. Um, disrupting habitats like shelter, food sources, water sources that may attract birds and small animals to the facility. That's another uh, way we can um, bring uh, high path AI uh, to the facility. Um, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act protects the migratory birds. So um, any sort of um, bird, uh, bird um, removal efforts, uh, you wanna definitely check with uh, your Department of Environmental Conservation, make sure we follow those guidelines. Non-lethal methods like harassments and hazings and um, removing the empty nests and other, are other options for bird control. Obviously, uh, netting and screens and decoys and devices that scare birds away and perch deterrence are all, all um, good options for minimizing wild bird populations on the farm. And then also obviously don't, don't feed wild birds that will only attract them. We wanna cover up those compost piles if, there's, if they're composting carcasses um, to prevent carnivores and wild birds to, from scavenging there. Um, we don't wanna use untreated surface waters as a source for drinking, for wetting down uh, paddocks, um, to um, power barn misters, or to clean equipment that comes in contact with cattle. And then um, we should be doing this anyway, but we should be fencing off those ponds and non-drained um, water areas to prevent animals from um, entering those, those places. Consult your um, wildlife professionals, wildlife and wetlands professionals about managing uh, those areas. Preventing um, cow and calf exposure. Um, we wanna feed only heat treated colostrum and pasteurized milk and milk products to calves. Uh, that includes your, your beef calves. Um, if they happen to be getting unpasteurized colostrum or milk from a dairy. Um, the transmissibility of H5N1 strains to other species like cats and pigs and other mammals uh, via unpasteurized milk is not known at this time. Uh, the effect of acidification on milk to inactivate H5N1 is also unknown. Um, and what studies there are shows that um, the extreme high and extreme low pH uh, that, that demonstrated inactivation also made the milk um, uh, coagulate and made it kind of unuseful for, for feed purposes. Uh, so there is a potential risk of feeding unpasteurized uh, dairy products and milk components to adult cattle. And so there needs to be some additional work uh, to determine that transmissibility risk. Uh, for fomites, um, so we don't want to walk or drive through areas where uh, bird feces may be present uh, before entering livestock areas. If that's not possible, um, use an EPA registered disinfectant on those contact services. Uh, the nice thing about uh, this virus is it's uh, susceptible to pretty much all of our disinfectants if used correctly. New York State Ag and Markets um, uh, has stated that they've not detected uh, this in cattle in New York State at this time. And so actions such as like truck and wheel cleaning and disinfection uh, have not been instituted. Uh, these recommendations uh, could change. And obviously we wanna provide clean water and waterers to all the uh, cows and, and calves on the facility. Uh, particularly these uh, sources are a place where um, wild birds can gain access and um, uh, contaminate uh, those, those drinking sources. For managing um, sick animals, um, we want to move animals with clinical signs uh, that look similar to what was described previously uh, to a dedicated hospital or sick pen. That area should not share spaces with other animals on the farm. So that's air spaces, fence lines, uh, feeders, water troughs. Um, the herd veterinarian um, for the farm can determine when and how to allow recovered animals to return to the main herd. We definitely want to milk this group last and follow um, your standard milk system sanitization steps before. Um, milking other animals through those same milking facilities. We wanna dedicate caretakers and equipment to those sick animals, um, work with those last, um, if that's not possible, um, and wear gloves and um, encourage uh, proper hand washing after handling these animals. Clothing and footwear and equipment worn or used around these sick animals uh, should not be worn and used around other animals until it's been properly cleaned and disinfected. 
additional precautions for animal caretakers and their veterinary staff. Um, so the current risk to the public remains low, but again, as previously mentioned, um, for those who come in direct contact with these infected animals, um, they should take additional precautions. Um, and also precautions should be taken for those who handle um, raw, uh, unpasteurized milk. Uh, so federal agencies um, recommend not consuming unpasteurized raw milk, unpasteurized raw cheese, uncooked or undercooked meat from animals with suspect or confirmed H5N1. Um, this is a general recommendation for the prevention of several foodborne illnesses, but definitely applicable here. Um, CDC uh, recommends uh, these following steps to reduce the risk of H5N1 infection in people on livestock operations. Um, I mentioned some of this already, but uh, there's a little more detail. So these people should avoid unprotected direct physical contact or close exposure with sick or dead birds or other animals, carcasses, feces, milk, or litter from sick birds and other animals potentially infected or confirmed to be infected with H5N1 virus. Uh, those protections could include um, an uh, N95 filtered face mask respirator, eye protection, and gloves, and we're going to perform thorough hand washing after contact. Now, much of this uh, detail is based on poultry worker recommendations. And if you're going to use um, special PPE, definitely want to make sure that um, you're trained to use those, um, those pieces of equipment correctly. Uh, those exposed should self-monitor for new signs of respiratory illness, including conjunctivitis, for 10 days after exposure. And if noticed, um, seek medical evaluation by a clinician or the public health department. Uh, like I mentioned before, a nice thing about this uh, virus is it is rather susceptible to um, a lot of things, um, most of our disinfectants, if not all. So cleaning um, followed by proper disinfection of equipment and footwear helps protect cattle from a lot of viruses and bacteria, including uh, this virus. And uh, this is a, a link uh, to the EPA's list of uh, registered uh, di disinfectants for um, avian influenza. And then lastly, so what do we do? You know, what, what do you do if you have sick dairy cattle fitting the original case description on your farm? Uh, first step would be to promptly contact your herd veterinarian. Uh, they will coordinate the care of uh, that animal or animals. And if appropriate, they'll contact their state health office um, for um, diagnostic sampling uh, uh, guidance. Uh, for us here in New York State, um, this comes from the New York State Department of Ag and Markets. Uh, you contact your local office. Uh, again, New York State Ag and Markets, Cornell University's College of Veterinary Medicine Animal Health Diagnostic Center, and the USDA uh, NVSL all co are coordinating um, diagnostic sampling plans to um, get the right samples to the right place the right way. And just wrapped up here, uh, sharing some um, resources where um, I gained a lot of this stuff and where um, these, this information is uh, updated on, on a very regular basis. And so that's the USDA APHIS news and update site, uh, Centers of Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, livestock veterinarians have uh, the aabp.org resource for, uh, for their members. Uh, New York State Ag and Markets for here, uh, New York State. National Milk Producers Federation. Uh, we've got some points of contact here at Cornell uh, for um, additional resources. So uh, I'm available for um, uh, herd health management uh, type questions. Uh, for veterinarians looking for additional support, uh, they can reach out to the Animal Health Diagnostic Lab uh, through um, the, their dedicated uh, email uh, address or uh, the phone number provided there. Uh, their website also includes a, um, a page dedicated to the testing of cattle for iPath AI, and I included a, a hyperlink here on this. And then uh, finally, um, from a dairy food standpoint, we've got um, contact information there. And with that, um, I'll guess we open this up for our, our panel discussion.